so yeah we already have a few people in the audience like 19 something like uh, uh yeah and uh, it's this is the first talk uh, of our third iteration of uh, quantum machine learning journal club meetings and um, our first speaker is tobias and uh, i think in future professor dario will also talk and uh, like all, I, i think on 15 and then uh, yeah like there are other two persons also in the uh, like on the list so uh, uh, so today's talk is about some work which uh, toby did with uh, victor who is also there in the audience hi victor on uh, universal fully programmable universal quantum simulator with a one dimensional quantum processor so they are somehow giving some technique to uh, using ideas from Floquet theory to uh, basically how to uh, solve challenging problems with uh, uh, topologically constrained quantum processors. So, yeah, I mean, I think we can safely start the meeting now. Uh, Tobias, please continue. Yeah. Okay, so uh, then I start, I guess. Okay. So uh, thank you everyone for joining today um, for this first instance of the renewed uh, Machine Learning Journal Club. So as Kishore very nicely introduced um, the topic of my talk. So basically our ideas we want to um, show, I want to show that to you that you can use a one dimensional quantum um, simulator as uh, to realize like complicated problems which are normally difficult to address in with quantum processes. So you basically, the main idea is basically like keyed up in this um, picture here below. So we have like a very constrained kind of uh, quantum system available with very constrained connections. And by driving it, so we change the, the system in time, we hope to basically deform the system such that we realize a different system, let's say like a system which has a more complicated topology, which like in this case, you see there's like kind of a star configuration. And so to confirm basically, um, the dots are basically supposed to be like kind of like the, the, the local um, sites or qubits of the system. And by driving basically, and the, the edges are like kind of like the connections in the system. So basically, we want to form a system which is very, very simply just a chain. We want to uh, deform it such that like it forms like a more complicated topology, let's say a star. So basically, by driving, we want to make the system more expressible. So as, as Keisha nicely introduced, like this work was not done by me alone, but um, this was collaboration with uh, people from Japan, in Victor Bastidis, uh, Lee Monroe, and uh, Kainimoto from an entity in NI in Japan. And okay, so um, let's start. Okay, let me check. I'm trying to change the slide, but I can't see this slide. Oh, and now I can change it. Okay, will it work? The change? I hope you can see a new slide, perfect. Okay. Okay, um, so give me like a brief introduction. Um, um, so what we basically want to achieve in, in recent near-term computing, we have a lot of advances that has been made. So there's a lot of excitement with Google and IBM like leading the race to build better quantum, quantum computers based on superconductors. And right now we're in a, in a regime where they have like access to modern number of qubits, no error correction though. And various milestones have been achieved we have recently. Like we can, Google achieved quantum supremacy recently using randomized benchmarking. One can like, achieve like Hartree Fock kind of like systems. So basic simulation of quantum chemistry and also like can originally find the, the ground state of systems. This was basically made possible by these kind of like newly made quantum processors. And, um, and in this kind of time, um, I want to now um, mention like what kind of systems can be, or what kind of problems can be well addressed in these, uh, these machines. So they work very well on problems that can be basically tailored to the specific device. So Example, like Google has a Google's quantum chip has like kind of a configuration where you have like kind of a grid-like pattern, or the IBM machine looks kind of like this, where you have like a I don't know what, how you can call this this kind of configuration, and so whenever you have a problem which basically fits very well to this kind of kind of configuration, uh, what I mean by exactly by that, I will come later to them. So if you fit well, then the you can actually easily address it. So for example, like if you have like this kind of lattice kind of conversion, then it's very convenient if your problem as well has, is arranged in a kind of a lattice. So lattice meaning that if you have, let's say uh, one node, then this node should only interact to its four neighboring nodes. Not like this node should not interact, let's say with the node on the other side of the system. If you have these kind of like problems where you have like, where like the nodes interact like in a non-trivial way, 
then this becomes a bit more complicated. There's a price to pay. Same goes as well as like if your system um, has more complicated interactions, it's complicated interactions. What I mean by that is, let's say, um, what the current machines are very well good at is like implementing two qubit operations and single qubit operations. So for example, IBM is very good at implementing this called cross resonance gate, um, which basically gives you interaction between two qubits. However, if the problem does not conform to this simple standard, like it needs like more complicated interactions, then um, again, you have to pay a price. So to give you an example, um, physically what's very easy to realize are one and two qubit operations. So for example, like, like for example, would be like a T gate or like a C not gate, which index between one and two qubits respectively. Um, if you of course now want to have like a multi-qubit rotations or multi-qubit interactions, you need like a, let's say a three qubit interaction, which is like, let's say here, you see like, um, this is the so-called Toffoli gate, which is in the in interaction between three different qubits. So it's like a control on the first and second qubit and a, a bit flip on the third qubit. And if you basically decompose this into two qubit operations, which natively can be easily done, then um, you need lots of those, right? You need one, two, three, four, five, six, six of those um, C not gates. So meaning like this kind of interaction take a lot of time and effort to, to make. Could think of like, is there a way to maybe to do a different approach to, to, to realize like multi qubit interactions? And they're actually quite important for many classical problems, for many difficult problems, which are difficult on classical machines. For example, like if you want to study chemistry, let's say you want to have the how an electron moves inside a, a molecule between molecule orbits, then in order to do so, you have like kind of these terms here, which are very important. So these are like hopping operators, which describe hoppings between the J orbital and the K orbital of the, K, of the molecule. And because these are fermions, um, if you now map them onto um, a quantum computer, you, um, you basically can implement them by basically X gates and a bunch of uh, one, two X gates and two Y gates, which act like on the system. This is X, Y gate, which basically induces the basically this tunneling of the electron between side uh, between orbit J and K. However, if J and K, if the two orbits are not next to each other, but like separated, then you additionally need like these kind of Z terms. So these additional uh, sigma Z operations, which span all the way from the side J to the side K in between. So if the two orbitals are far away, let's say the first orbit is one and the next orbit is like far away at side 10, then you need nine of these C operations in between. So in the end, you have like a highly complicated um, 10 qubit operation. And if you now decompose this into two qubit op operations, then um, this is quite complicated, as you can think of. And, and for other problems, let's say you want to have a classical optimization, then there's a common benchmark, it's called a SAT3 problem. And I will go into detail later, but just for now, just think of it as like a problem where basically you have some kind of equations and which, with constraints, and then you try to optimize set equations. And this problem can be mapped onto a Hamiltonian. However, in general, if you map it to a Hamiltonian, you realize that there's, um, there's like these kind of terms that appear. So these mu's are supposed to be um, Pauli operators, Pauli, Pauli spin theorems. And it turns out like if you do this, then even in the most, you, in even the most simplest instance, you will find there's like these kind of terms, which are like mu one times mu two times mu three. So these are like um, three qubit bit flips you have to apply for these kind of problems. And as you can easily see, like, um, they're again, they're like, they're like three qubit operations. So again, if you want to now map them into two qubit operations, again, you have to decompose them in two qubit gates. Um, another issue, um, or a thing you always have to consider when you work with um, quantum computers is like, um, only physical neighbors can interact with machines. So, so different example, let's say we have like this kind of, this is an example of a chip that has been used um, recently for very interesting experiments. And this chip has like kind of like a 1D configuration. So these kind of thingies there, they basically, they, they make up one qubit. And one of these qubits can only talk to its immediate next neighbor. So this qubit can talk to this one, and this one can do this one, and this one, and so forth. But let's say now we want to have the, the first qubit talk with the very last qubit, let's say. How can you do that? Like directly, they're not connected. So physically, there's no, no direct connections, only indirect by the other qubits in between. So you can basically easily test this for yourself. If you want to check it out how this works. Um, you can go on IBM website, and there's this, IBM machines you can play around with. So like this is an example like of this example of five qubits. This is the IBM row machine. If you then apply this machine, 
and you want to implement a, a scene alteration between the first qubit of that quantum computer and the last one, then if you then, you can basically easily just write it down and tell it to do it. But if you then actually like map it onto the quantum computer, you will find that what you get is actually this here. So the reason is that in order to facilitate interaction between the first and last qubit, you need to have in between lots of swap gates, which basically mediate the, 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 this, this operation in between. So basically this simple like long range connection actually maps to many, many intermediate operations, simply because the connectivity is not very good. It's not as suited for the problem. So it prefers like nearest neighbor interactions kind of. Okay, um, so we ideally we want basically that the specific problem where like specific problems require certain qubit connectivities. And if they don't match, you basically have to pay a price where it's additional swap gates. So something like if you had have like this nice hardware grid here, of the system, then you can easily solve problems which match this. But if let's say you have like this kind of more complicated structure or even like this Sherrington Kirkberg Patrick model, which had like all to all connectivity, then uh, this gets a bit more tricky to, to, to map. Um, that one idea like how you can basically um, address this is like you, you, you create specialized circuits. So you make like a fabricator specialized quantum circuit, which has not, let's say this, simple graph structure, but may, maybe a different structure. So what um, smart people in, in, in have engineered is like this kind of system here, um, where basically you have qubits, which are like coupled to next to each other via some interaction. And additionally, the, the qubits, besides being coupled to the immediate neighbor, they're also coupled to some kind of bus. So, and via this bus, all qubits can talk to all qubits. But if this kind of system, like the, the coupling is fixed, so these qubits can only talk in a fixed manner to each other, and this is not very, controllable. So whenever, you, so this is very good at solving one specific task, but let's say you have now another task, which is like a different kind of configuration or different kind of interaction strength, then you need to make a new chip designed from scratch. So, so the idea is like you can create specialized circuit, but again, you have to, to work and to make a new chip for every new design you need. Um, okay, so, um, so yeah, you thought like, um, let's go, step a bit back and like think of like what actually, um, how do our superconductor process actually work internally? So we're going beyond the, this abstract description of not gates and think of like more going to the low level, what is actually happening a bit inside. And the, the internal dynamics in the superconducting processor can be described by a bose haber model. So what happens inside is basically you have kind of like this, this picture is basically shown here on the top bottom right. It's like you have like a bunch of um, kind of resonators and in this version, like you can have basically photonic excitations and you can have them. And they can, they can basically jump from one side to the other side. So one resonator is coupled to the other resonator. And this um, coupling from one resonator to the other resonator is basically described by this kind of term here on the right. This is it's called hopping term, which really describes like the, which basically this term here, A, A L plus one basically describes the destruction of a photon at site L plus one. And then it creates a new photon at site L. So basically this is kind of a hopping between one transmon qubit, uh, transmon um, resonator to another resonator. Another term we have is on the left, this term here. So this NL is supposed to, is um, the local energy of the, of the photon. So it basically describes kind of the energy level of the system. And, um, and this energy scales with the number of photons you have inside. So you can think of basically, this is just the, the local energy of inside the system, of the resonator. Finally, you have this, this nonlinear term here, just goes with NL times NL minus one. So this is a nonlinear term. And this term basically um, only becomes important if you have more than one photon. So if you have like two photons in the system, this term will give you like an energy offset, a nonlinearity. And in turn, when you make this U very large, this will heavily suppress multiple photons. Because like if you have one photon, okay, but if you have two photons, this term will come in and will give you a large energy offset and basically like make this kind of um, process like energetically uh, undesirable. Okay, so the internal dynamics is basically described by this model if you go like to the lowest level and you can basically think now what can we do on this level. And one thing uh, people have looked at, you can actually drive the system. So what I haven't mentioned so far actually is that um, these kind of coupling terms here, so this nearest neighbor hopping, J, as well as this G, which is the controls the, this, this energy on each um, transform can be changed in time. 
So you can basically modify this term during the runtime of the processor. So it's not fixed, but actually um, it's now very well read, has been demonstrated, or it can be done that you can change this parameter in time and you can adjust it. This U is normally fixed, but this G and this J can be time changed in time in a quite precise manner. And it can be changed very fast. So faster than the dynamics of the system. And these parameters you control by some kind of micro world pulses. So you can send them like by some outside line, you can basically send a microwave pass and this will adjust this, this parameter in time. So you can change this parameter during the runtime. And you can, for example, think of using this to engineer the dynamics of the system. So basically by changing this parameter in time, you can modify now the circuit in time and see what happens. Okay, um, so what we propose now is basically we now use the driving to create arbitrary um, effective Floquet Hamiltonians. Okay, so what are you gonna do? So you're gonna parallelly drive this, the Hamiltonian in time with a specific period T. So meaning we basically we change, adjust these parameters in time. And then we, we do in such a way that after this time T, um, it repeats. So we make a certain driving scheme and until the time T and then basically it repeats again and again. And <clears throat> And you can think of this basically now this um, kind of driving the generator unitary. The unitary that, um, that describes the dynamics until this for one period T, it's basically then given by smaller steps. So it is like you basically we chop um, the changes in time into discrete steps and during each, each um, small step, we basically we keep the parameters more or less constant. So for one particular like smaller step where we keep up with the time, time uh, the parameters constant, the Unitary is given by simply the exponential of the um, Hamiltonian. And then basically the final um, dynamics for one period is then given by the when you multiply all those unitaries together. So this is shown you on the top right on this graph here. Basically we have like different unitaries and we basically for different times and then we multiply them together and this gives all the all dynamics for the final time t. So it's kind of like a, a stepwise protocol where basically the parameters are given by the bottom right. So what you see is basically the, uh, the each line here basically is like the, the parameters at a specific time t. And then we have different control parameters, one, two, three, four, five, which are like the different parameters we can change. And let's say for the time t1, we basically choose a certain specific, so the first time step, we choose a specific set of parameters. Then for the second time step, we choose another specific set of parameters and so forth until we have one period T. And after period T, basically it repeats again and again and again. So this is how we can drive the system. Now we can ask the question, what happens? So instantaneously, the semitone is changing a lot, right? Driving it. it looks quite probably quite complicated, like how the driving appears. But what happens at times at multiples of this period time t. So we, we specifically look at dynamics at the specific time t, um, big t. So after one period, after two periods, after three periods and so forth. And we only specifically look like what is our system looking like that at this specific time. And at this specific time, the um, dynamics can be described by a stroposcopic Hamiltonian. So what you do is you, you take the unitary, the uh, unitary at this, at this period t, take the logarithm, and this is basically given us the uh, Hamiltonian, which describes the effective dynamics. Meaning it looks like at this, at this times period t, the system effectively behaves as it will evolving according to this kind of Hamiltonian. And this effective Hamiltonian can be quite different than our actual Hamiltonian that we have at a given point of time. So at every given point in time, the Hamiltonian is like the our constrained, let's say, nearest neighbor model that we had before. But at the specific times big T, um, effectively the system will now behave, can, the system is now able to behave differently um, because we only look at this stroboscopic time, we only look at specific instances. And you can now basically check what kind of, um, what kind of Hamiltonian are achievable what kind of effective dynamics you can see at these specific times. And here's now basically the following again. Okay, so we have our, let's say 1D Hamiltonian, who's a Hubbard Hamiltonian. And if you now, 
So this is like a neat picture of what it's supposed to be. Like this one has nine sites. So we have like nine resonators. And each of them, we can control the local, in, uh, the local energy, resonant energy. And we have kind of fixed coupling. So we assume that the coupling between qubit one and two and so forth is fixed with some constant J. You can now basically write down the Hamiltonian as a kind of a matrix. So we, we, we take this Hamiltonian and then write down all the matrix elements. And if you have a single photon in the system, so there's just one photon living inside, then the Hamiltonian looks kind of like this. So what you see is basically the, the color is the strength of the um, matrix element of the Hamiltonian. And the numbers here basically correspond to each side of the system or state. So one would basically photon be in side one. Um, this would be then photon side two, three, four, five, and so forth, until like photon being in side nine. And this picture basically describes the, the, the matrix elements that we have. So in our simple nearest neighbor Hamiltonian, we have only elements which look kind of like a kind of like a diagonal ladder. What it means basically is that um, that side one, photon side one, is coupled to photon side two. That's why there's a, no, an element. And side, photon at side two is coupled to photon in uh, is to photon basically photon from uh, side two can couple to photon in side three and so forth. That's why basically we get this kind of ladder. So this basically ladder basically encompasses that you only have a nearest neighbor Hamiltonian where only immediate nearest neighbor can talk to each other. This is what we physically have in our system. So this is all we have. So now we basically change these parameters in time, we drive it. And we now, let's say this is now our driving scheme for this parameter G. And after doing that, we look now at the effective dynamics. So we look like how does the system effectively behave at multiples of this period big T of the driving scheme. If you only look at that particular moment, you can now calculate this effective Hamiltonian that describes the effective dynamics. And it turns out what we get is then this kind of star topology. So if you write down the effect, corresponding effective Hamiltonian on the right, you see now the connectivity is now instead of nearest neighbor, it's now kind of a star. So site five is now coupled to all other sites. And that's the only coupling we have. So we have completely changed the geometry of the problem. So initially it was like nearest neighbor, now it suddenly becomes a star. So meaning by driving, we can completely generate new kind of um, atonians which are completely beyond uh, what you have. So we can go beyond what is physically, what your physically constrained system offers and engineer something which is uh, completely different. And we basically, um, okay, now we can ask the question, how do you get this kind of driving scheme? So, so how do you know how to drive? Okay, so we can actually use machine learning that. So there's a method called uh, GRAPE, Gradient Ascent Pulse Engineering, which we use for this particular method. In principle, you can use any, um, any machine learning method of your choosing, be it Krotov or some kind of deep learning, reinforcement learning. It's all up to you. Here in this case, we choose GRAPE. So here's the following. <clears throat> so you have a given set of driving parameters. So this, this G's that I talked to you before, the local energies and you would have them in time. So you set a particular choice. Um, okay, after choosing that particular choice, you, um, you calculate the, the, the unitary. So you calculate the evolution under your the Hamiltonian and you get your final unitary for the time T. Then you calculate the overlap. So we have the overlap that you actually get with our driving scheme against the basically what we actually want to have. So the target unitary will basically the unitary that has this star kind of pattern. And then we calculate the overlap. And initially, if you just check a random set of parameters, the overlap will be probably pretty bad. But then we up update the parameters by our gradient ascent. So it is the following that we basically we calculate the derivative of each parameter against this uh, fidelity. And, and then basically we use that to make a small step so we basically we used it to make a small step to, towards a better solution. So you can think of this basically like here on the right side, this basically encompasses this kind of gradient ascent approach. Um, so this is like the kind of the, the landscape of the problem here simplified to two dimensions, but this also applies for higher dimensional problems. So initially this is the starting point, starting point of our configuration, we have a low fidelity. Then you make a gradient descent upstate and we go a bit up towards uh, a bit better configuration. And then using this new updated parameters, we then again run our algorithm, calculate our gradients, and then go to the next step and find the next better, make a, again, a small step and try to find the next better set of parameters and so forth. 
you know, you basically follow this trajectory, eventually we'll end up at the, hopefully end up at the optimal solution. Okay, so we basically now try to use this for different types of effective antiphonians. So we still stick with our nearest neighbor coupled 1D chain. And now we drive the onset energies and our couplings. So this problem I already showed you before. This is the problem for the one excitation for one photon where we try to create a star kind of topology. So what you see is basically this is the first A is basically the first image is showing the desired topology. Then this is the kind of effective Hamiltonian, what it looks like for this problem. And the third one is basically the simulated, um, the driven effective Hamiltonian that we found by applying this driving scheme. And the right side basically shows you the actual driving scheme that was used to generate the effective Hamiltonian. So we played this game for the StarCraft, that's already explained to you. Then we can also play the game now for a different topology. Here we have now a fully connected topology, meaning we want now that every side is coupled to every other side. So we have a Hamiltonian where basically everything is coupled to everything. And we now want to do this for two excitations. So there's now two photons in the system. So the system becomes now more, more complex because um, the Hilbert space is now much larger. And if you take this Hamiltonian and map out the Hilbert space, uh, the, sorry, the Hamiltonian, it looks something like this. So it gets very funky, but just believe me in the end, what this is, is actually this kind of all-to-all -all connectivity for two photons. So basically you have to calculate all the many body Fox states for two photons and then calculate all the matrix elements in the end you get like this kind of funky structure but in the end it just encompasses this kind of configuration of all whole connection and by simulation we basically we can now do the same and basically get something which looks reasonably close with this kind of driving scheme and where we drive the onset energies as well as we also drive the couplings in this case and the third case we also try to create um, three excitations we have now three photons in the system and we want to have a ring configuration so we basically want to deform such that the 1d chain now suddenly becomes a ring meaning um, site one is now copied to site nine. How do we generate this effect again? And you can see this is the hematoin that looks like, this is the, what the hematoin looks like. And this is what we actually simulated. So it, it looks pretty much similar. And this is the driving scheme again. So this was done here for three photons in the system and um, an infinite interaction. So we choose that the interaction is very large, such as like um, two photons can't sit on the same site. Okay, um, so this was more like we looked at like physical systems. So now we think about can you use apply this to like a uh, an optimization problem. So I'm now referencing again this three side Hamiltonian I showed you earlier. Okay. Okay, I think I mentioned the three side problem earlier, but just let me go through it again for a bit. So what it encompasses basically you have a set of um, Boolean equations. Boolean equation meaning that the variables can either be zero or one, one of those numbers. Now you have a set of equations that you want to fulfill. And each of these equations basically has three components. And now you have basically, um, in, in, in principle, this problem is NP complete in the worst case. So if you scale to many, many, uh, many, many instances, then it's something which is believed to be hard to be solved on a classic computer. Okay, now for a demonstration, we just pick like a, a simpler instance which has only three equations and three um, Boolean numbers. So we, we pick this particular instance, these kind of numbers, and we want to basically satisfy this equation. Um, to solve in a quantum computer, you have to we can map it to a Hamiltonian. So basically, we map this problem onto energies to an energy problem. And if you do that, it turns out that you require at least three qubit interactions. So this problem cannot be solved with just two qubit interactions, but instead you also need to include three qubit interactions. So this is shown here. So this is the Hamiltonian. The mu is supposed to be um, Pauli's. So these are all Pauli's um, Pauli X flips acting on qubit one, two, three. And it turns out that you have like these terms which are considered to be nice, like one and two qubit interactions, two, two Pauli interactions, but there's also like these terms which encompass three different Pauli's. So these are like notoriously um, more tricky to, to achieve natively on a machine. So what you do is we, we take this, this Hamiltonian problem and we simply map it to a map it to a, a 1D chain. In this case, we can map this problem to a chain of eight, eight sides with one photon. And if you then map out the problem, 
in, in, in the, we choose this particular basis here, then we, in this particular basis, it turns out it to look something like this. So this is the effective topology of the connections you need. So in this case, you need um, kind of these connections and all connections also have different strengths. So this is indicated by colors. The different color means different strengths. So blue means um, you have a negative kind of coupling term and orange means you have a positive, uh, positive coupling term. And this is basically the target Hamiltonian that you want to have. And this is the, the, the similar one that we can achieve via drive. Okay, so we can basically realize this kind of effective Hamiltonians by driving the system purely. Okay, um, of course, this is not the solution yet, right? Because now we have the Hamiltonian, but actually we're not interested in the Hamiltonian, but we're actually interested in the ground state of the system. Because the ground state of this system will give you the optimal solution. So the solution that basically satisfies these equations. So how do we go to the ground state of the problem? Now do you have uh, the effective Hamiltonian. So we basically um, utilized the concept we know from uh, called quantum annealing. The different quantum annealing is very simple. You start with an easy Hamiltonian, which you easily can prepare, and where you also the ground state you, you are able to easily prepare. And once you have that, you slowly change now the system. So you totally change this Hamiltonian, basically from this easy Hamiltonian to your difficult target Hamiltonian. And the adiabatic theory basically, um, um, if you do it slow enough, you, you can be sure that the, that the ground state will follow you. So basically, basically you start with easy Hamiltonian, where you have the proper ground state, slowly change the system until you go to your target Hamiltonian. So basically, you slowly switch off your easy Hamiltonian with this factor, given by this factor lambda, and you slowly increase the, the target, this difficult target Hamiltonian. So basically, you change the lambda basically from initially being zero to slowly to lambda being one. And the ground state will follow you if you do it slow enough. Um, so we now try it as a proof of concept, just to show that it can work in principle. We use this now with the floquet. So meaning the, um, we do the same thing now with uh, not a static Hamilton, but with a driven system. So we slowly change now the driving protocol from, from a simple instance and to, uh, to the complicated instance. So in particular, what we do is initially we start, so this is the, showing the scheme. So this is the basically initial effective Hamiltonian, which is just generated by having a static um, kind of, you have a static Hamiltonian, which is um, just changes the onset energy. So it's a very, this is actually a linear, um, okay, so this is a very simplistic single um, constant Hamiltonian that we initially chose. And then the idea is that we slowly switch on our driving protocol. So we slowly increase the strength of our driving, the amplitude of our driving. So, so initially we have static, and then we slowly switch on. And we hope that basically we go from the, the, the ground state of our initial static Hamiltonian by slowly switching on driving, we then move on to the, the target Hamiltonian, the, the ground state of the target Hamiltonian. So what you see here now is basically how the effective formula changes when you know, let's slowly switch on the, the driving. So initially just have like kind of this, and it was just kind of like linear. And then you see like it adds on like off diagonal terms. And you see initially like the off diagonal terms don't spread very far, but then they spread further and further until the whole encompass the whole system. And eventually we have the, the neat pattern that we need for our target Hamiltonian. So you can see like how the system basically evolves from being static by driving you slowly, then go to your target effective Hamiltonian. And for this kind of problem, we, we basically also map out the quasi energies at every point in lambda. And we find that actually the quasi energies in this case, they are always separated. So the blue line is the ground state energy and it always separates from the rest. So there's no overlap. And because there's no band crossing, we also find out that actually we can now tune the, the system and see how the ground state follows. So, and this is shown here in this graph, the blue line, the, the graph C shows basically the fidelity of the actual state where we have to the, the ground to the ground state of the um, instantaneous Hamilton, of the current effective Hamiltonian that we have for a particular lambda. Okay, so what this means basically, um, this is basically the overlap that we have between our effective Hamiltonian at a, at a specific lambda with the, uh, with the one that we actually generated by driving the system. Okay, and so what you find here basically that the fidelity always stays close to 
plus to one. So we basically transform the system from being this easy initial Hamiltonian, uh, easy, easy ground state to our target ground state of the of this ex eventual three set problem. Of course, to do this, you have to do this slowly. So you have to change this driving protocol over many, many periods. So it is like that every driving period, you slowly change the parameters a bit. So this is, and then, yeah, then eventually you end up where we want it to be. Okay, so the bottom line is by driving the system periodically for many periods and slowly ramping up the, the driving potentials, you can prepare the ground state of the effective Hamiltonian. So in this case, you basically find the, the ground state of the three-step problem, and then we can resolve the ground state and basically determine the solution to our three-step problem. This okay, so this works. So another thing we looked at was, um, we looked at a very simple demonstration for quantum chemistry. In this case, we looked at um, this lithium H molecule. So as I, I into this early introduction, um, molecules have always a problem that the um, that because the, you have non-local interactions, because you have these um, properties of the fermions that when you have two fermions and they interact, they create these kind of sigma z terms in between. These are called your weakness strings. So this means in general, like if you uh, try to solve this problem, you have many qubit terms. So you have multi-qubit terms, which are quite a bit tricky, uh, very, they have the usual problem that these multi-qubit terms, you have them decomposed to two qubit gates, which is in general complicated. Uh, again, we use this problem and we map now our lithium H molecule. We can actually map this to a 16 side 1D chain. And the, the so it's the usual one nearest neighbor chain I showed you earlier. And then we drive again and we see that we can basically create the kind of the Hamiltonian that, that basically encompasses the, the, this molecule. And it looks kind of complicated. So I actually, in this kind of problem, like every, every side is connected, to every, every state is connected to every other state. So if you basically uh, write down the, the Hamiltonian as a matrix, the matrix looks like, like something like this. This is, the, this is the actual matrix on the bottom. So this is the matrix that describes the, the, this kind of uh, molecule. So you see like everything is pretty much connected to everything. So it's, uh, but we can basically simulate this using our driving scheme, our effective Hamiltonian. Okay, um, this already I want to come to a conclusion. So I hope to basically show you that using these one-dimensional quantum processes, we can, by driving them, we can realize effective Hamiltonians. So we look at the dynamics at, um, at multiples of the driving period T. And by using this, we can actually generate arbitrary connectivity. So we could like deform the uh, simple constraint 1D chain to uh, this kind of star topology or to all connect topology or to a ring. And we can also simulate these multi qubit interaction terms, which are important for, and we can simulate the more complicated problems that have multi qubit interaction terms, such as like tree start or the molecule, the lithium H molecule. And the nice thing about this whole piece of procedure is that we simply change the, the driving protocol. Something which can be, um, nowadays can be controlled very well. And the nice thing is just now we just need one kind of constraint quantum simulate, like this 1D chain. And you simply change now the parameters. And depending on how you change parameters, you can realize any geometry. So by choosing a particular set of parameters, you can simulate your, your star topology. Then you basically just change your parameters. And then now you go to an all to all connected problem and so forth. So basically one system, just by adjusting the driving, you can, you have the complete freedom to, to manipulate the system, to, to mimic any other system. So it makes the system, um, is we can overcome this problem that the system has a fixed geometry by, by driving to realize pretty much everything uh, and, uh, and problem with arbitrary connectivity. So this really is a very nice feature of our study. So um, yeah, with this, I again point you out to a paper on the archive number if you want to study further. And I think with this, uh, I would like to conclude and I thank you for your attention. And uh, yeah, thank you. I see clapping. I simply imagine the clap clapping now in my head. Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks, Toby. Very nice talk. And uh, I think there might be some more questions in the, from the audience. Mm -hmm. If you have something, please ask. Hi, Toby. Hey, how are you? 
Uh, yeah, so I have a question about the robustness of your protocols. So, so when you have this kind of um, pauses in your unitary, mm. um, have you checked whether this solution is robust against, let's say, errors in the pulses? Because sometimes um, mm. if you have a slight deviation from the ideal pulse sequence, then what you mm. might have is a sharp drop in the fidelity of the unit. Mm. So yeah, I just want to check if the, you have checked for the robustness. Yeah, I think we, we ran some tests for robustness. So um, I mean, this was not the main goal of our study. So we just want to, this is more like a proof of concept that actually that you can do this. Um, if I remember, you can, we made some check on the robustness so you can um, um, change the parameter a bit and it's still like you get of course you get a, a smaller fidelity but there also a few percent decrease i think right right so um okay yeah then another question i have is mm -hmm. um what is the advantage or motivation of using a discrete power sequence con compared to mm -hmm. a continuous for example if you write it in the Fourier mm -hmm. basis then you still have the periodic uh, driving right um, absolutely, absolutely, then, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, then you can tune the amplitude of your period, your Fourier uh, drivings. Yes, yes, you can do that. Um, um, of course, if you okay, so we choose the so why we choose the, the discrete one. So the discrete one um, matches very well what you actually right now can do on the supermagnetic the process. They can basically adjust um, the the while they, while they adjust the the, the the tune microwave pulses. You can actually change them very abruptly from one step to the other. So basically, you, it very well matches like what you can do experimentally. So they have a very, um, so you can make like very small discrete changes in the problem. So it matches like what you can experimentally. Of course, you can also apply, as I said, this kind of sign pulses. Um, and if you do that, you all have the problem that the grape doesn't work so well anymore. So, um, So um, if you use grape, um, you need to calculate these derivatives. And if you have a kind of a discrete test problem, where everything is like discrete, then these, calculating these derivatives is quite easy. And um, if you have now these, um, and also the optimization is, is, is more straightforward. So you, you will very fast converge um, to your target state. If you have now um, these kind of Fourier pulses, um, so I think the calculation of derivatives will be way more involved. And I think also the conversions, like the problem becomes non-convex. So optimization is way more, uh, I think this problem is always non-convex, but in this case, the problem, the optimization becomes way more trickier. So you, you miss many of the nice features and uh, it will be way more difficult to converge to the optimal solution. So I think then other methods like a uh, of probably are more, more suited for this. So bottom line is, um, it is both from experimental side, it's, uh, it's convenient to have discretized as well as also from a numerical side, it's convenient for optimization. That's why we chose it this way. But yeah, you can absolutely do it also in other ways. Mm, I see, yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Is there any more question from anyone? Uh, yeah, I have questions. Yeah. So first of all, thanks, Toby, for the very nice talk. Um, so I have questions about like, mm. for, for this one, right, basically you, you are like uh, finding an approximate like, uh, Hamiltonian for your targets, right? And mm, this is not exact Hamiltonian, it's approximate. Well, I, I'm wondering like, how, how will it be affect the systems or maybe the solutions for like the for crack learning? Oh, sorry, I didn't get the last part. It will affect the solution for what? Uh, like, because you use you, you this uh, Hamiltonian to basically uh, do quantum annealings and then get, get mm. the power state of it, right? And if this Hamiltonian is approximate, how will uh, it affect your solutions? Sorry, the Hamiltonian, <laughs> sorry, there's some kind of static, I think. Oh, okay, yeah, because the, your, 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 okay, your... Simple, you asked about the quantum annealing, right? And, uh, yeah, quantum annealings. Uh -huh. yeah. So if your Hamiltonian is approximate, it is approximate a Hamiltonian of the target Hamiltonian, right? So how will mm. this affect your solution because it's not exact? You get what I mean. Ah, right, right. It's not exact, yeah. Um, correct. So if you don't have exact Hamiltonian, of course, you, you don't get the perfect ground state. Um, okay, so of course, it will basically follow, right? So if you have... Um, 
if your target effective antonym is not perfect, then uh, also oh, the yeah, concept yeah. will not, in general, not be perfect. In this particular case, actually, um, uh, we're looking for, we have kind of a classical problem, so um, I think there's some leeway, but let's say if you want to prepare a, a quantum state exactly, then yeah, there will be a relative error, right? Like if you don't prepare your effective window perfectly, then you have the usual, um, also the concept will not be perfect. So, I mean, like you know, the, the, if, if your Hamiltonian matrix is well conditioned, mm -hmm. then in that case, the, like if you change like, it a bit, like, you know, mm -hmm. then the ground state will not change much. So like you can always have like four nice matrices. Mm -hmm. uh, you will not have this problem. Like it will be robust enough. Like, yeah. But mm -hmm. obviously there can be adversarial situation. But for practical mm -hmm. purposes, I think it's okay. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Hi, sorry. In your yes. uh, optimization oh, procedure, hi, to oh. you. Uh, what are your constraints? What do you set as, uh, you know, limits on, let's say, number of uh, limited operations or the range of the... Ah, okay, uh, okay, yeah. ...and use and so on. Okay, okay, okay. The yeah, so we have... Correct, correct. Um, yeah, I didn't discuss limits at all. Okay, very good point. Um, so we have basically had our superconductor system in mind. So we basically set parameters that basically match these kind of systems. So um, in this case, for example, we, we fix J to, let's see, um, to some number. Um, okay, this is our reference number, basically. The G basically, it, we varied, I think, between uh, minus 5J and plus 5J. So, um, so I think J was in order of 20, I mean, Victor knows this stuff better than I do. But I think J is on the order of 20 megahertz in standard um, quantum processes. Um, also U is fixed, uh, or am I wrong? U is also, um, yeah. Okay. So at this point you fix J and U and you show that just by changing J, G you can... Yeah, correct. Can, Only by okay. changing G you can do this. And the G is basically fixed to some seasonal value. So I think it was between minus five and plus five J. Um, so these are like, these are like the, the current things, uh, the current values you can easily adjust on, on current quantum processes. So this is a, but firstly, you can change G with. And roughly, what is the ratio between U and J? Do you know? Um, what's the ratio between J? Um, I have to. I think it was an order of twenty, but I may be wrong. Maybe Victor can help me. I think Victor knows. It's more. In, in the Google chip, is five times. So it's like fifty. J is fifty megahertz, and U is three hundred fifty megahertz. Three point three point five times. Mm. Yeah. Okay. I think for the where we did the graph two, I think we assume U was uh, three times J. I forgot. Okay. So I think the the, the second graph was like we, we use similar order as J, and the third one we basically assume that U is very large compared to J. So it's pretty much infinite. Okay. But I think you. use a parameter you can tune at fabrication level and there's, I think. Um, and, and when you looked at the stability, I think uh, uh, Daniel asked you about the stability mm. Uh, mm. regarding to errors in the pulses. I think uh, the questions was related only to unitary errors. What if you mm. have like dissipative errors or other, what then? Quite did, you, did you actually mm. look into that already or you're planning to do that? Are you planning to do that? So uh, yeah, it's currently what we're looking into or you can start your business. Um, correct, like, yeah, yeah. There's obviously two main sources, right? You have, uh, first of all, you have um, photon loss. So it can happen that basically the, 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 the excitation lives in the system, like just leaves or disappears or gets destroyed. Um, this is basically one source of error you have. Of course, in principle, that one you can, um, you can do post selection, right? Like if you, if you measure your system and you realize like the photon is gone, then yeah, you just discard that measurement and saying this was faulty. Um, I think more tricky one is, of course, then decoherence. Um, yeah, that one basically will like, decoherence will basically may affect you more severely, right? Because it will change like all the phases in the system. Um, yeah, so this is definitely like, I think the main source you have to consider. This case is, much, is quite tricky because while here mm. you can have an effective Hamiltonian, mm. uh, even if you model your dissipations with Limbladian, mm. you will not typically obtain a, an effective Limbladian. Yes, correct. In general, we'll be just generally CPT map. 
mm, you will have to do things uh, mm. fully. I see. Interesting. Yeah, in general, you can't define it. You're, you're correct. Like in general, like if you have uh, an open system, you there's no guarantee that even if, that the open system dynamics can be mapped to an effective limb bounding. Yeah. Um, but you can still check like whether or not the dynamics of your system maybe is close enough to what you would hope it to be. Yes, in, in, in the case, what would you look at? What would be the distance that you're using to, to optimize? Yes, it's a great point. Actually, this, the, the distance, I, I'm still thinking about that one. What is the proper distance to measure? Because in general, you would get some kind of super operator, right? If you have the, so you have a super unitary, so it's a super unitary. So you would kind of need to calculate the, the fidelity of the, the super operator with your actual unitary. So far, I couldn't find any proper measure. You, you can so look at the thing distance between channels. Uh, you compare the, the behavior of one channel and the other, and then you mm -hmm. look at the distance between them. If you look maybe at all possible states or, mm -hmm. or some characteristic states you're interested in and, and see how this behaves maybe. Mm -hmm. okay, okay, so you have to map everything to channels. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Are there any more questions? Hi, hello. Uh, I have hello. a question. So uh, first of all, thanks so much for the talk. I really like it. Okay. Uh, my question is on the, uh, when you do the machine learning, mm. so basically your cost function is the, uh, the fidelity between your target Hamiltonian and your uh, flow gate Hamiltonian, right? Yes, or yes, correct, correct. So uh, in practice, when you do this one, do you have to simulate like the, the whole matrix to, to find this cost function? Yes, yes, correct. So you have to simulate the full unitary to, to calculate this, right? Because you want to have the, the general overlap, right? That applies to every possible state. So definitely you need to calculate the full unitary. So is, uh, in, in your mind, is there uh, like uh, another way that it cost, cost this one mm. may not well, right? Let's say if I have like a system with like 50 qubits and I yes, want yes. to mm. make the like a to, to make like another topology with that 50 qubits mm. cannot put for this uh, this uh, simulation. So is there a, any a, any alternative way to do this? Yeah, once you go to many qubits, of course you can't simulate the full unitary as you correctly said. Um, in this case, you could, um, as Dari actually mentioned, like um, you can look at the because normally, in general, you're not interested in every possible state, right? Actually, you're only interested like a small substates of states. So you could like um, choose like a specific substate, subspace of states you're actually interested in to know the dynamics. Mm -hmm. Then basically benchmark your your um, dynamics against that. So you basically you would check that this kind of small substate subspace of states that you're actually interested in behaves according to what you wish it to be, and just check for those ones. So I mean, yeah, of this course you don't get, you can't be sure that you actually get the actual effective Hamiltonian, but maybe just something which is um, close to it maybe, or yeah. But for these kind of large systems, this is the way you can approach it. Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, uh, thanks Uthru, for the nice questions and everybody else. If, uh, are there any more questions from anyone, like from the audience? Uh, if there is no question, then I will ask one uh, last question. Like, can Toby can I ask? <laughs> so, so you know, like, uh, so one of the things you know in this, uh, I mean, I like the beauty of your uh, paper is that uh, you are basically engineering, uh, like, uh, you are basically saying that that whatever constraint they are coming from topology, we do not. Mm -hmm. uh, really get constrained by that, by, mm. by, by engineering these long range interactions. Mm. And um, that helps you kind of, you know, like uh, uh, bypass the qubit routing problem. So like mm. many of those uh, swaps, which were, you know, yes, like yes, yes. help you kind of, uh, put the, uh, some kind of gate between first one and last mm. one, or wherever you want. So like uh, mm. your algorithm proceeds something like, you know, I mean, your technique basically proceeds something like, uh, 
you start with something, some some uh, some restricted topology, and mm -hmm. then you locate the right to reach some topology, and uh, mm -hmm. whatever gate you want to apply, that gate you can, you know, the 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 final topology has the ability to apply that gate. Mm -hmm. Now let me let you know. I'm I'm just trying to think about like a regular uh, quantum computer, where mm -hmm. let's say first I apply some gate which acts mm -hmm. between you know like first one and third one. The second mm -hmm. yeah, in the second layer, there you know I need a, let's say third one and seventh one. Mm -hmm. If you know these kind of uh, like uh, configurations are mm -hmm. not present in like you know you like when you did this kind of locate drive in first time. So will it mean that every time, like for each layer, you will have to kind of uh, run these pulse sequences and then um, engineer that. My only worry is with respect to coherence time. If this thing, let's say that, with respect to scalability. So if you increase the number of qubits, so let's say 50 or 70, and mm. for that, you know, you are trying to like uh, run this, uh, this kind of machine, um, okay, like uh, mm. machine, or the protocol mm. to engineer, or like if this is not fast enough, then uh, like I'm just asking, is it mm. to take care of the coherence issue in the mm. in, in the quantum computer? Or uh, yeah, because because yeah, there's a, as you quite mentioned, like if you have like long connections, you are there's a fixed speed, right? How fast the information can travel this is the yeah, yeah, yeah. quantum speed limit, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's certain bounds you can prove like how fast, what is the, given like this kind of instantaneous Hamiltonian, let's say the nearest neighbor chain, there's a limit on how fast information can travel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it depends on kind of like what kind of connection. So if like a long range connectivity, let's say like an ion traps, yeah, yeah. The, the quantum speed limit is, can be much faster since you have like long range interactions. Mm -hmm. um, quite like, yeah. So in principle, like the, the larger system, the the more time it will take. Um, we, we actually, we checked like how is the scaling for single photons. So we went to the regime of uh, one photon, which um, is more numeric friendly for our com classic computers. Mm -hmm. So actually we found that there's a linear scaling. So the time needed to, to engineer this long range effective Hamiltonian um, scales linearly with the length of the system. Mm -hmm. So basically, this is the coherence time you would need. Basically, so it's, at least for this one photo machine, you would need like a linear time to to. to yeah. yeah. So the, the yeah. So definitely, like the larger system, the coherence time also needs to grow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's no way around. I think this is uh, yeah, yeah. the quantum speed limit like, will block you. Fundamentally, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, it's 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 a quite cute idea. Yeah. And, uh, I. I hope uh, industry. I mean, this is like this concept of bus, right? I introduced earlier, like which you can actually do. So you can like introduce a bus that uh, connects more of these qubits together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you like, if you improve on that, like make it more configurable, then this is also something you can use as a resource to to engineer better couplings, better unitaries. Okay. So yeah, very nice question. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks to me for the answer, and uh, thanks uh, everyone for attending uh, today's talk, the, the session. Mm -hmm. I think it was quite interesting. So our next session is on uh, 15. Professor Poletti will speak on uh, some work which he did uh, uh, recently, I guess, or I, I, I haven't checked whether it's published or not. He has some some very quite interesting work, but I think open system something. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, and and if somebody of you like want to suggest some speaker, like because uh, I mean, as as Umesh Bajirani says that you know, like during these times, even if we are isolated, we are like completely connected graph because of Zoom. So I mean, <laughs> if you want, we can write email to anybody on the planet, and uh, we would like to have them here. The only restriction is the time zone. So if you have some suggestion or or if you want, you know, write email to somebody and like uh, suggest them for uh, as a speaker in this, uh, yeah, I mean, like uh, for the journal club talks, that would be also awesome. So yeah, with that, I kind of uh, close the session for the day.